medical oncologist and both an and an epidemiologist, and I get to sit back and look at what's going on in cancer. Now, 40 years ago this past December, Richard Nixon signed the National Cancer Act. Many people considered that the nation declaring war on cancer. It was about seven years after Luther Terry, the then Surgeon General, had said that cigarettes caused lung cancer. It was after a long experience with cancer, as you can see here, and I don't have too many number slides, but I'm an epidemiologist, so give me a break. <laughs> Going from 1900 through 1970, when the, uh, 1970, 1971, when the National Cancer Act was signed, you can see there was a dramatic rise in the mortality rate from cancer. Now, 40 years later, it is very appropriate that we ask, what has now happen? What did we get out of this 40 years war? Well, the first thing that I'll show you is the decline in mortality that we've seen since 1990. The act was signed in 1971. Some people thought we'd cure cancer by the bicentennial in 1976. That was a little forward thinking. And then, but finally in 1991, cancer rates started going down. Indeed, today, the risk of death for an American is 20% lower than it was in 1991. Indeed, for breast cancer, the risk of death is 30% lower. For colon cancer, 35% lower. So we have made some progress. We've also learned a few things. Here you can see men have a higher death rate than women, but the death rate for men is going down faster than for women. There is a male-female disparity that favors females. Here you can see that there are some racial disparities, blacks having a higher mortality rate than whites, and whites having a higher mortality rate than other racial and ethnic groups in the United States. We've actually learned something as well. We've learned that race is not a biological categorization. We've learned that race and ethnicity actually apply much more to customs and habits that cause cancer than they do to racial genetics. From some of these studies, we've actually figured out what some of the causes of cancer are. And here are the major causes of cancer. Today, a third of all cancers is caused by smoking, and nearly a third of all cancers is caused by this combination of obesity, poor nutrition, and physical inactivity that you heard about so much yesterday. Literally over half of all cancers are caused by those two vectors. Here you can see the decline in smoking from 1964 and 1965 when the Surgeon General made their, the uh, report on lung cancer to today. About 20 to 25 percent of Americans still smoke. We can still do something and do something very positive. Here you can see the problem with obesity. In 1970, 15 percent of adults were obese, 2008, 35 percent. In 1970, and this is even more important, 4% of kids were obese, 20% of kids are obese today. It takes 20 to 40 years of obesity to cause cancer. As we've had this incre incredible increase in the rate of obesity, it's pushing up on that mortality curve that I've shown you is going down. I'm worried that over the next 10 to 15 years, Obesity, lack of physical activity, and poor diet will be a greater cause of cancer than tobacco in the United States. I'm worried that instead of a decline in mortality that we've had now for more than 20 years, we're going to have a mortality rate that's starting to go up. The mortality rate, keep in mind, I told you, has gone down partially because of prevention, also, this thing called early detection, people being aware, women saying, what's this in my breast, and going to the doctor, people realizing there's a change in the caliber of their stools, and going to the doctor, being assessed for colorectal cancer. But screening, doing certain tests in people who are to totally asymptomatic, has also been beneficial. Treatment has also been improving over time. Now let's talk a little bit about the screening thing because there's a problem there. We in America tend to think screening is a lot more effective than it actually is. I've gotten in trouble in the past for saying that, but I'm going to say it again. You see, in breast cancer, the decline in breast cancer mortality, that 30% decline I told you about, less than half of the decline is due to mammographic screening. The majority of the decline is due to women saying, hey, what's this? 
and improvements in treatment. It's not radiology that's caused the majority of the decline. It's awareness and early detection and improvements in treatment. Now, mammography is important. It's actually caused 40 to 45 percent of the decline, but it is not the overwhelming thing many people think it is. We're starting to realize there is a type of, there is a type of screening that is actually not healthy and actually not good. And the big issue is overdiagnosis. There is a type of cancer that we sometimes find that looks like cancer, but it is not predestined to grow, metastasize, and kill. It may be 25% of all localized breast cancers. It may be as much as 60% of all localized prostate cancers, and it exists in lung cancer, thyroid cancer, and other diseases. But there is a type of cancer that we can diagnose with today's technology that will not kill, and indeed the worst thing we can do is actually treat it. Unfortunately, we don't have a test for it. Now, how could we get into this? And the answer lies with this fellow, a fellow named Vir Kao, pathologist, active in the 1840s and 1850s. He did a lot of autopsy studies. And Vir Kao, by the way, was the guy who figured out that cancer was uncontrolled cell growth. He did his work with H&E stainings, which he helped to invent, and with this new thing called a light microscope. And he drew the profile of what cancer looks like. He would look at something like this. This is an H&E slide he'd look, of breast cancer. He'd look at something like this, and then he'd be able to draw it out and say, this is what I'm seeing, this is cancer. And he really defined the profile for cancer. And you see today, with all of our technologies, with all the radio, radiologic imaging and other things that we have today, we can now actually find a one centimeter tumor in a woman's breast or a one centimeter tumor in a man's prostate, send it to a pathologist, and the pathologist says, this fits the profile of what Virchow called cancer. They're not really saying this is cancer. They're saying this is what Virchow called cancer in the 1840s. See, the, the controlling metaphor here is profiling, something in the news a lot today. We as pathologists and doctors are using a 19th century definition of cancer in the 21st century. It's actually an early 19th century definition. We actually need to have a genomic definition, a modern day definition, so we can say this thing that looks like cancer is inherently programmed to either stay at one centimeter and never move, never metastasize, never cause harm, or it's genomically programmed to metastasize. The cancer that we need to watch versus the cancer that we need to treat. Right now, we know that we're over-treating a lot of cancers. In breast cancer, we over-treat, but we save lives. In prostate cancer, we hope we're saving lives. We don't know as well. The data is just not so certain. So we really need to be careful. We really need to start being more scientific. We need to think a little bit about what we're doing at every step as we're doing it. And as I like to say, a good scientist understands three things. What we know, what we don't know, what we believe. And a good scientist is constantly re-examining what we do is called research because we have to keep going over and over searching for the truth. And when we think something is true, we then need to question that. Unfortunately, it took us 170 years to get to that point in terms of our definition of cancer, but we are there today. There are a number of genomic studies and genomic tests that are being developed that may help us have a definition of cancer that e doesn't even require that we say lung cancer or breast cancer. It's going to be what 21 genes are turned on or turned off or overexpressed. So thank you very much.